a trumpet player. I'm, I just turned 55 and I've been playing since I was 12 years old. So that means I've been playing uh, like 43 years or something like that. So I've been, I've had the horn on my face for a long time. For the past 20 years, as of this month, actually, I've been playing with the Airmen of Note uh, in Washington, D.C., the United States Air Force Band, the premier jazz ensemble of the United States Air Force. I was in a couple other Air Force bands. I was, before I came to D.C., I was in the, um, the Falcon Airs, the big band for the, uh, the Academy Band in Colorado Springs, some friends of mine who, who gave me a call. That's how I got in the Air Force. They were like, I don't know if you'd be interested in this, but there's a lead trumpet opening down here. And, uh, you know, if you want to come audition and check it out, it's been an incredible experience, it's been incredible, uh, being playing in the top big band, one of the top big bands in the world. I play split lead trumpet. It's one of the few big bands that still uh, rehearses and performs virtually almost daily together. Uh, so much time together with such top world-class musicians that we get to really perfect this art form of big band music. And so I first fell in love with big band music when I was in ninth grade uh, and sat in my first big band and when I was a freshman in high school. And I was like, man, wouldn't it be great to be able to do this all the time? A lot of people get to play in big bands uh, from time to time. Not as many people get to play in it uh, every single day. Getting to the Air Force and the Airmen Note, I've gotten to meet all of my heroes. I've played with Randy Brecker, I've played with Doc Severson, become friends with him, played with Alan Bazzuti, played with Bobby Shue. Just all my my heroes growing up, I've had the privilege of like becoming friends with them, just talking with them casually over dinner uh, and just being uh, getting to soak up their life experience, you know, and even some of the great new artists, like uh, I call them new because they're they they weren't around when I was in high school. But you know, guys like Wayne Bergeron, who's played with us, you know, we've come we've become friends. Folks like that that are just the the latest greatest uh, on the on the LA and New York scene. So it's it's just been a, such a gas and such a great experience. I have less than two years to go in the Air Force uh, before I retire. Uh, and that's, I think about that a lot. It's, it's a, you know, it's a part of the military, so you can't stay in forever. But I would probably do it forever if I could. <laughs> uh, how your life and work was before, you know, COVID came and knocked everything over? What, like, normal life is like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The fun thing about this this job uh, with Airman Note is that the, the schedule is really constantly changing. There are some predictable things that happen throughout the year. Like in our summer concert series, which is coming up, we play in various venues around D.C. One of our big venues is is actually close to where I live. It's in National Harbor, Maryland. There's an amphitheater, uh, which draws a lot of uh, crowds naturally. We played in front of the Lincoln Memorial. We played in front of the Capitol Building. We played at the Air Force Memorial. We played at the museums on occasion. You know, there's just a lot of nice tourist traffic in D.C. during the summer. So it's kind of like playing for uh, uh, a national audience, really, because people come from all around and they're from all over the country. In the fall, we are, uh, we'll take a tour to uh, different parts of the country uh, for a few weeks, and that's always fun. Over the years, I've gotten to see every single state uh, in the continental United States. The only ones that I haven't seen yet are uh, Alaska and Hawaii. And we'll do the same thing in the spring, a nice tour. We also have a great series during the uh, winter and spring called the Jazz Heritage Series, uh, where we invite uh, top uh, jazz artists to play with us in DC. And we'll not only have a, a great live show, but we'll record it for broadcast. Uh, we'll make a CD of it later and we'll send it out to like 700 jazz radio stations around the country. So a lot of people will actually get to hear that show. Those are some of the events where I've met uh, you know, some of my heroes. So last year we played with uh, Randy Brecker. I mean, that was, you know, incredible. He was such a phenomenal artist. And that's where we've played with uh, Alan Pizzuti, with Doc Severance, and all these, uh, all these folks that I uh, listened to when I was growing up. The inaugural parade every four years, uh, when the, there's a new president-elect We'll, we'll always march in that parade. We're not not every single thing we do is jazz. Sometimes, sometimes it's very ceremonial what we do. Sometimes at um, Arlington National Cemetery for full of honor funerals, you know, I've played taps out there, uh, and I've played you know for ceremonies with the like a 15 piece ceremonial group when we laid veterans to rest. The chief of staff of the Air Force might host uh, 
a, a prominent leader from New Zealand, for example, and they, they might go to his house and have dinner with him. And over on the side, uh, in the corner, it might be the, the rhythm section for the airmen and they'll playing some tunes, you know, to, to help the evening. And they might do a little show, uh, and they might even have learned, uh, like a New Zealand folk song or something, something interesting for the guest. The job is very uh, unique in that respect as well, because there's a lot of events that the public doesn't see that we're involved with. We were very active still during uh, the lockdown. We just had to do it all like virtually. You know, we did a lot of video products. We have a pretty uh, extensive production office in the band now. We probably even greater than it used to be thanks to COVID. Over the couple of years, we, you know, we had at least like 5 million views on our videos that we have made. So we're still getting, we're still getting a lot of exposure just in a very different way. But one of my favorite things that we did, we took a song uh, that we've played a whole lot called uh, I'll Be Seeing You. It's, a, it's an old tune from World War II that talks about, you know, I'll be, I'll be seeing you when I get back home kind of thing. That's the idea of it. It worked very well for COVID because it was like, you know, we're all kind of, stuck at home and I'll be seeing you when this is all over. And, and the other thing that we did is that we connected with five other international military bands from, from Japan, from Finland, from Australia, from Brazil, uh, from Germany. We're kind of locked out with still maybe even connect in a way that we never have before. It took a lot of coordination. Uh, but you would get to make friends kind of in a new way with, with uh, fans across the world that we really hadn't uh, connected with on that level before. So that was really cool. We came back slowly. Um, we, when we first came back, we were rehearsing with the band, but we were spread out, you know, all over the room. You don't see the whole band at the same time because we had recorded the saxes separate than the rhythm section and the trumpets or whatever. And then finally, everything started to kind of release all the those regulations. The one regulation that was still kind of holding on was the ability to, to have public concerts in an indoor uh, place. And so those finally started to, to release as well. And so we've had a few public concerts uh, indoors locally. One of our Jazz Heard and Series concerts that we had. Uh, down here, we had two major lockdowns, you know, t type where you can't leave your house. I don't know, it looked like a mess in the US from, from our standpoint. I know there's the different states had different rules, you know, stuff like that. Right. But, so between the lockdowns, there was a brief lull um, for a couple of performances, and then we went straight back into lockdown when Omicron came and swept over, and we only just opened back to normal like a month ago. I don't know how long have you guys been like back to normal? It's kind of like uh, just now starting to feel uh, normal. The jazz festival, for example, that's happening next week. So that that is something we, we haven't really done. Uh, in like two years. We actually, this uh, next week, we're playing at the Jacksonville Jazz Festival down in Florida, North Florida. And then we're gonna go down to uh, play at the Disney Springs. There's an amphitheater out there. We're gonna play a couple of evenings during uh, Memorial Day weekend. Conferences, you know, we, we this year, at the end of the year, we're playing for Midwest. It's the biggest uh, band and orchestra conference in the US, maybe one of the biggest in the world. Like I said, one of the bands that we connected with was the uh, the German Defense Forces band, kind of like our equivalent over in Germany. When we get back from Florida, like in two weeks, we're actually performing a live concert with them. They happened to be touring uh, through the U.S. Then they called us and they were like, "Hey, we we want to do something together with y'all. If you if you have time to fit us in, we'll come to D.C. and we'll do something side by side, both bands on the same stage." Uh, performing some arrangements that were made for two big bands to get to finally meet them face to face and make music together. That's going to be very special. What do you think the music scene will be like in the near future? I know you said you're retiring in two, two years, but you know, what would, what do you think is going to happen? I was wondering about that myself. I was wondering, are people just going to get used to not seeing live music and then be like, yeah. oh, I'll just stay home now because I like being home. Well, what's happening right now I can tell in the, like the local music scene, for example. Yeah. I'm seeing that people are actually like, I really need this. I need to get out and be with other people. I need to hear live music and feel it. Of course, you know, my Facebook is full of uh, pr probably most of the trumpet players in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. You know, connected. But I can see that they're all working a lot 
because the, all these gigs have come back, you know, the shows have come back to to Broadway and so forth, and, and the local theaters, the, the touring big gigs have come back. All we can do is hope that it just stays that way, you know, that, that people always remain passionate for live music. I have this random video, you know, of us messing around or whatever, and, you know, it's just... I, I think that's similar to what you do, I think, because I see a lot of stuff in that, that you put up, you know, either on, like, YouTube or whatever, and it's just, like, little little phone videos, you know? My personal uh, Facebook, I, I'll just... I'll throw up the camera during rehearsal on, on the stand. There's some crazy, you know, part coming up, and Brian's going to play a sick high note, and so I I'll, I'll catch it. Remind you every year that, that you did it, so I get to see these things yeah, over and exactly, over. Exactly. Yeah. To me, it's not an interruption at all, but it's like no, to, no. to grab out your phone and to grab something. Not not many people are, are bold enough to, to do that. But then you then you you would miss such a great moment so many times. You know. You play really up, up like upwards, right? Upstream. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have an underbite? Uh, no, but I do. I do stick my jaw out when I play. Does that like have, has that ever caused you? Problems like in the jaw? Uh, no, not specifically in the jaw. Uh, I mean, I had to make some uh, adjustments. Well, see, the way that I play, it was, it's very, uh, I would say, self-taught for for the beginning uh, of my existence. I mean, of course, I had you know band directors and, and yeah. rudimentary teachers, uh, but the way that I play and the way that I developed my, my lead trumpet style, uh, probably for at least the first 10 years, was on my own. I, di I didn't have anybody that was uh, nearby that was that type of player. I, but I didn't have anybody t to tell me like how to play high or, how, or, or ideas on protecting yourself from playing high. I was just young and indestructible. When I was young, I didn't think efficiently. So I, I just started thinking more efficiently and that was very uh, critical. So I learned how to put the compression down low uh, in my abdomen. So I wasn't having any tension up here. It was all down here, which was where it's supposed to be. I finally started getting exposed to uh, professional players that were kind of doing what I was doing. And then I would I would pick up and I would listen. I would, you know, when I would go to conventions and stuff or make friends with with some pro lead players or whatever, just listen very carefully to what they said and about how they approached the horn. You know, when I got into the Airman Note, I mean, talk about having a, a daily lesson in efficiency just sitting next to Brian McDonald. He was like the flawless version of efficiency. And she's like one of those guys that just didn't even look like he was working. Sit, standing, sitting right next to him for 20 years now. Um, what have you been your favorite gigs? My favorite gigs have been the ones where I literally got to play with these iconic figures that I considered just my heroes growing up. Before I got in the Air Force, I, would, I played a lot with the, a pops orchestra that would have guest artists. So I was probably like 21 years old. I got to play with like Al Hurt, who's been gone for for many years now, but he, he was just one of those iconic players from uh, from decades before, uh, a New Orleans player who had just tons of crazy technique as well. There's almost nobody that I haven't been able to play with now at this point. Doc Evanson was such a, a remarkable experience the first time, and I played with him probably half a dozen times, and, and we've we you know we've hung out. I've smoked a cigar with Doc Evanson, you know, <laughs> he was, <laughs> and just I've got. Uh, just some great experience because he's such a just a great person. But the first time I played with him, he was uh, he was 83 at that point. He was 83. This is what was remarkable. Uh, there was this tune that we played that it featured three trumpet players, me and Tim Leahy, the jazz one of the jazz trumpet players at the time. So we went out and stood right next to Doc in front of the band and played on either side of him. I always thought that I was like a pretty 
strong player in terms of just like if, if I wanted to put on turn on the gas, you know, I could I could fill up the room, I could play loud. That's what turned me on about the trumpet, the sensation of just being able to make so much sound. So I would be playing like my heart out, and then he would play, and he sounded like ten of me. He at 83 years old, he was still his his sound was so enormous, like I couldn't even believe it. That wasn't even at his peak. It was a great experience and part of my favorite concert because that was the sound that inspired me as a young player. I found some Dr. Sevenson records in a, like a like a like a pawn shop. I took them home and I knew of Doc Sevenson from the night show, but I didn't watch it a whole lot because I was, you know, it, it came on late and I just needed to, you know, get to bed, get up to school. But these records uh, I obsessed over because I thought his sound was just so amazing all the way from the top of the horn to the bottom of the horn. So I would just like bury my head in the speaker and just try to absorb the sound and just like wonder how to, to obtain it. <laughs> 